Little Team 2. She's out there. We'll wait a few more minutes. Um, I'm Adrian Martin. Um, can we have the lights out, please? Out. Out. Mm -hmm. Can you turn the projector on, Ian? Now, let me get this. Um. Mm. This talk is mainly oh, devoted loud, louder loud. loud loud okay whoops what are we going to do about this focusing this talk is based on um, my portrait work um, and I want to discuss or talk to you or tell you um, what my basic inspirations, visual inspirations are, because there's music, there's books, there's other forms of inspiration, but I just want to talk about and show you um, visual inspirations, which are paintings and other photographers' work. Um, I am from Dunedin. I've been living in Auckland about two and a half years. I've had quite a bit of my life in Australia, and I became greatly influenced by Australian photographers, not New Zealand photographers. Although I am quite well versed on New Zealand photography. It was the Australian photography that kind of got me going because I got involved with the Australian Centre for Photography in Sydney. I left Dunedin um, in 1979 and this particular work is a work by Eva Monk called The Cry. And it's a work that I um, looked at, have looked at for, for about 10, 15 years and have long admired or just totally loved the expressionistic style where he expresses pain and agony, <laughs> which is something I was interested in, in trying to express in um, my photography. I wasn't really, can you hold that for a minute, I'll take my coat off. Um, I wasn't really interested in anything else, in beauty or aesthetics. It was mainly emotion that I wanted to bring out in my work. And this particular image was one that um, I saw on the cover of a book called The Primal Scream, which was written by Arthur Yonhoff. You may be familiar with it. And the previous edition of the book, they had a painting by, by I think, Ernst Haast, I think. Uh, but this one I felt was a lot stronger and, and I like the style of it. Um, this is another drawing. I followed Bonk. Um, I saw a movie of his life uh, about 10 years ago um, where he was very interested in expressing 
his feelings about what he felt were within his family environment. And his family around him were, suffered from a lot of sickness. And it was a very morbid film, and it concentrated on morbidity very, very heavily in the way it was shot. And, and the tones, the colours, very washed out and pallid skins. This particular image um, is um, an etching, um, which is called Young Adolescent Girl, Puberty. There's all different renditions of the title. And the light, the force of the light and the simplicity of design was something that well, I felt very stirred by. Um, I felt it was very poignant and direct and simple, and I love the simplicity of light and shade. And I found it had a drama all of its own. And the black space that was quite enigmatic, her, she looks very vulnerable, lit there, um, and contrasted with the, with the dark shadows of the unknownness, her future. His work is very literal, you, know, you can read it like that. This photograph is one done by an American photographer called B. Nettles. It was um, a, a part of a series called Escape, where she did about seven or eight pictures that depicted her voyage from this apartment she lived in, which was a very prison-like building, and her moving away from it. And this is one image, because it was an aeroplane. And I, at the time, was terrified of flying. And the image was just so powerful. I like the structure of it. I like the grain. I like the, the square shape. Uh, it, it inspired a feeling of terror and unknownness. But also, that beautiful white cloud was like a feeling of hope being up there. It was just really beautiful. And I arrived in Australia in 1979, after a few years away and saw a lot of Australian photography. This particular image is by Fiona Hall, who I just fell in love with this picture. Um, I saw it at an exhibition of Australian photography in Sydney. It was to do with the 1979, they had a, a Biennale was on then, Biennale, and I liked the, the flat spaces, the, um, the mystery, the enigma, the, it was very mysterious and beautiful and peaceful image, and I liked the way she had expressed that feeling within foliage, trees, gardens, and I found that, that her content, her subject matter, just seemed to be extremely expressive of states of mind. And my state of mind at the time was quite tortured. <laughs> I can laugh now, it's a long time ago. Um, <laughs> And I um, was undergoing a bit of psychotherapy at the time when I saw this particular image. I'd just left New Zealand. I was in Australia. I was scared, very, very scared. And um, so therefore, this image, I just wanted to photograph trees and foliage and things like that. So I went away for a weekend into the Blue Mountains and came out with this um, image, a series of uh, four images, three from the Blue Mountains. This is taken, it's one of mine, it's taken, um, it was the beginning, it was a kind of a journey, a path, and, uh, but those two blocks, those two, they, they were like guards preventing me from going further. But at the same time, I wanted to go further to find out, and that's where I was heading in my own work. I, at the time I did this, I was working on 35 mil, as you can see, and black and white was, um, what I'd been working in for a number of years on other photography and I still wanted to work with it. This is another picture from the same walk. It was a walk... I'm sorry about this focus. Um, these three pictures, the next one, plus the one I just had, were all done within about an hour. It was the walk in the Blue Mountains. This is the other one the last one of that, the three taken there. Um, I'll just let you look at that. It's a blue gun. And then about a year later, I um, 
wanted, I was invited to put a show on at, an art, at a gallery and I didn't know what and I'd just come away from doing this work and I thought I'd like to extend it but in a slightly more positive light. And this particular image I found in Seacliff in Otago on a drive late one evening or early one evening. The light was very strong because I felt I wanted to collect images for my exhibition. But then when I did, did the print, I, I became dissatisfied with this particular series of work. I didn't have any, this is an Australian photographer, for the previous picture, um, I didn't have any um, enthusiasm for following that path anymore in my work because I didn't want to say that anymore. I didn't want to talk about torture. I didn't want to talk about pain because I didn't feel it. I didn't, I didn't feel that way. I wanted to talk about other things, um, not necessarily superior or better, but just something different. And this is an Australian photographer, Grant Mudford, who showed a lot of work in Sydney and I saw a lot of, um, a big portfolio of his, I handled the prints and they're really big 20 by 16 prints of work he'd done in California. And I love the, the clean open space, was, which is in direct contrast to what my previous work had been. And the, the sort of clear expanse of space and tiny significant details um, just seemed very open and very pleasing and very Australian, even though it was a Californian image. It seemed to express Australia. This woman, Judith Turner, was a photographer that I had seen her work in Melbourne just before I left Australia in 1980. And I, I loved it. It was very clean, once again, this very light expanse, um, beautiful carving up of space simple. She's an architectural photographer. She photographs a lot of buildings uh, giving her own personal interpretation and um, her work is, I feel, really immaculate and I felt really inspired by, by her work. This image is by Diane Keaton, the actress. Um, she did a book called Reservations. I don't know if you're familiar with it. And I, I just, I flipped, I thought it was so funny. It was all about hotel foyers, um, interiors, um, that had quite a very strange, surreal aspect to them. And I liked her concentration on this side of life. It wasn't, it was, it, it just seemed um, sort of weird, funny, humorous. I liked her humorous approach. So I'm still working my way through from, my, from the past work to the future work. And this is what I'm seeing, this is what I'm exposing myself to. Um, and this was another series of work called Reservations. I liked her choice of black and white. I liked the square format. I liked the humour, whereas Mudford's work and Judith um, Turner's work was uh, a little bit too serious. And I, I thought, no, I, wanna, I don't want to be serious all the time. I actually would like to have a bit of fun with my camera. And Keaton inspired that fun element. So I did a series of photographs called Surfaces. Am I speaking too fast? No, but you could speak louder. Ah, gosh, really? <laughs> I'm just going to cope. Um, I did a, I feel strange speaking loud. Um, can you hear at the back? Yeah. Fine, that's right, I'll stay at this photo. If you can't hear me, yell. Um, this picture was from a series called Surfaces, which I made when I went away. I went on a trip. I bought this lovely car, a nice American car, a nice big Rambler, classic, a 1966 770. It's lovely. And it inspired a feeling of carefreeness and joy. And um, I put on, I found some rather <laughs> wonderful country and western music. And I took <laughs> off, <laughs> literally. <laughs> and, um, and I thought, I'm going to have fun. So I went away for two months from Dunedin, travelled all up to Wellington and Auckland. I thought, I'm just going to have fun. I've thought of these ideas. I don't want to be serious. I don't want to be morbid. I'm not interested in that. I'm enjoying life, and I want to express how I feel about it. Also, I felt a lot of strange things were sort of continually crossing my path in New Zealand. This particular image was actually taken in Dunedin, St Kilda which I think somehow expresses St Kilda, 
Indonesian. This was Hearn Bay, um, Auckland. Um, this was during my two month adventure with my camera and Panatomic X film. This is Oriental Parade, oh, Oriental Bay, Wellington. I was interested in formalism um, compositionally, light, uh, very bright direct sunlight. These were taken mainly in the middle of the day and or very late during summer, about six or seven o'clock at night, when the sun was very low but very, very bright or very piercing. Um, I drove along and I wore sunglasses, which somehow seemed to help view the textures. This is Crory Road. Oh no, this, this is not 35 mil. I, um, this is two and a quarter square. Any technical questions, I wouldn't, wouldn't, don't feel I want to answer them while I'm talking because I actually find a little bit of a diversion. But if you want to know my technical, my way of working, I have written something down on a piece of paper which is pinned up on the wall round beside the, um, that wall there, round the other side. So if you'd like to look at that and write down or just look at it, there's the answers to the film I use, the camera, all sorts of things. Because I actually find a bit of an interruption, or not an interruption, just a, a distraction. Then, I, after doing surfaces, Oh, it's the bloody focus. Um, when I did services, I did 22 images, and at the end, I just didn't want to do any more. I felt, well, I've had my fun. It was nice doing it, but I didn't want to continue with it. It got boring and repetitive, and in the end, I sort of felt enslaved to it. I was out looking for images in order to finish the work. I no longer felt that I wanted to express anything anymore in that way. And I've always had a very early interest in portrait photography, which I had been doing. This is Diarabas, by the way. Um, which I've been doing for years. Uh, I first started doing it in 1966, 67, um, at home. And, uh, but I never felt really satisfied. I potted around with it and dilly-dallied and didn't feel any real sort of direction. And then in 1972, I went off to Australia and visiting a friend, picked up a spare rib magazine, which is, I was involved with the women's movement then in Australia. And um, the spare rib magazine was quite interesting, except for the very back, they um, put in the fact that Diane Arbus, who had recently died in 1971, his work was uh, represented in the um, an exhibition in France, which was very rare, it was a special exhibition. And they showed this picture, they printed this picture. And it completely floored me. It just totally floored me. I had been brought up on um, cropping images severely, uh, fashion photography, um, camera club photography, um, and going to the library and looking at lots of books. And they all concentrated on I don't know, they just, they just concentrated on everything else but this, and this blew me away. And for the next two or three years, I didn't take any photos. I put the camera away. I took photos for other people on commission, a request, but I felt nothing. I didn't take anything for myself. Not until 1978 that I started taking anything for myself, and I saw this in 1972. Why, I, why it sort of impressed me so much was that it was, initially I looked at it and I thought, oh my God, it's, so, it's such an ordinary shot. It's about ordinary life, and it's photographed in a very ordinary way. That was my first impression. I was 21, 
I hadn't been to art school or anything like that. I had no other way of seeing it other than my own personal initial response. And, and, I, and I looked at it and I thought, God, it's so sloppy. <laughs> it's such a sloppy image. And it angered me. I went through a whole reaction. It angered me and I had to put it away. Then a few weeks later I picked it up again, looked at it again. And, um, and the people in it, I was forced to look at the people in it. And um, then I wanted to see more of Diane, Diane Arbus's work. So I went and had a look. And this is another image that impressed me amazingly. <laughs> and also the element of humour in it. <laughs> and once again, this, this very ordinary way of photographing, but the content being totally the opposite, you know, just totally unreal. And then I just went looking further at other people's work and looked at the work of someone who inspired her, which is Auguste Sander. And she somehow says, um, she's referred to the fact that she wasn't directly inspired by him, but actually she was, um, because the director of the Museum of Modern Art, John Sikowski, showed her a whole lot of his work while, when he first discovered her, or when she first discovered him, is, it, is what really happened. And um, his work um, greatly impressed me. Um, I like just once, that's called Widower, Cologne. Ah, this one, Jacob Rees, I found in a book. Most of these pictures are from books. Um, what I loved there was, okay, it was a very doomy, drastic kind of image in what it was of. And, but I removed myself from that and got completely involved in the composition. I didn't remove myself, I was very much a part of it, but I wasn't just absorbed in the woman in the photograph. I was deeply absorbed by the way in which she was photographed and the accidents that happened, the lucky accidents that happened, that I feel only photography can, can somehow create. A painter, I don't think, would have created that particular accident with the hand popping in there, and which is from the old form of powder flash being ignited. Also the bold structure, the, the, the plank, this, this very bold sort of formal shapes, how she almost resembles that plank at the same time, she's almost like that patch on the wall. Cir the circles, the darknesses, I won't go into too much about that, but it just seemed to hang together and beautifully. I thought it was a superbly structured picture that at the time Reese, Jacob Reese, who took the photograph, I don't think recognised, but at the same time, when he saw it on the contact, he saw it and decided that's, that's great. He didn't sort of knock it away and reject it because a hand had shot in the frame. He was open to what his camera gave him. I found that in a very inspiring force. This is a picture by Carol Jerrams, who was an Australian portrait photographer. I was very impressed by her work. I saw exhibitions of her work when I was over there. She, um, Carol Jones, tragically in 1980 died at about the age of 32 or 33. And that was, it's a tremendous loss. During her time she photographed Melbourne people mainly because she lived there. This particular image shot out and just of a head but the eyes, the that quite confrontational, like the photographer is confronting her. And in the way, the woman in the picture has got almost a confrontational hard look back, but she looks away. And I find that quite, quite menacing and very interesting. This is a picture by um, Joel Maritz, who's an American formalist photographer who very rarely, in the past, photographed people formally, the formal portraits. This particular image I found really, really beautiful and quite startling and stunning in the fact that he photographed formally an individual at, at, at a party. But 
there was none of the sort of flash and pop art look about it, like a lot of party pictures you see today are very sort of um, contrived. That one was very, it was just very beautiful. And I felt that was quite powerful, her looking back and she's being stared right back. And this particular image I just recently discovered, it's by Della Francesca. It's the Madonna about to give birth. And I found this absolutely wonderful. Um, I'm still sorting it out in my own mind because I only recently rediscovered it. Um, it's a fresco and um, I like the way, it, it looks very theatrical and stagey. And I like the <laughs> fact that that isn't denied. You know, um, it's quite obvious. Um, but at the same time, her, the, her position within it is um, very striking. And I like the fact that staginess isn't something to be avoided. It can be used to advantage. This is one of my portraits. For now on, next set was, is, is portraits I took. This one, oh, I decided then after, I've got to get back to where I'm staying from. When I did surfaces, I wanted to explore portraiture because I felt that photographing people for me was much more demanding. And um, there are a lot of different things that you can explore in photographing other people. A lot of different things I wanted to explore. And initially I wasn't quite sure what. All I wanted to do was photograph people. And this is a young man called Rudy Gouvenar and he asked me to photograph him. It's actually a portrait commission. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'll go back. I didn't mean to press that. Um, and I had just met him about three weeks before. Um, he stayed at a house of a friend of mine and I came over for dinner. And he saw a picture I had taken of another friend of his. And he really loved it and asked me to photograph him. And I said, well, I don't want to photograph you in a sort of a formal sense. I want to photograph you so it looks like I've just kind of caught you, but I want to have control. I want the image to have control and have control over you in the image. And um, so we worked out what he'd wear and I found a place to put him. And he did it in his lunch hour. He's a film editor of TV in New Zealand. And, um, I did two rolls. This one was very badly underexposed, but I managed to get a good print out of it. Um, but, and for years, I actually dismissed this image from my own port portfolio and only recently recovered it or rediscovered it. That one was taken in 1979. This was taken in 1980. In and it was quite by accident. Um, she was a hairdresser's model, and the hairdresser came in and wanted me to photograph her hairstyle. It's stunning, isn't it? And um, I, I did all that, the headshots, the profiles, things like that. And um, then after, when people were leaving, I asked her to stay behind. I'd like to take a portrait. And um, so that's what I photographed. These are two young women, sisters, foster sisters, who I saw at a nightclub in Dunedin. They were dancing on a dance floor. At the time I was with a friend and I was trying to describe to her the sort of pictures I wanted to take, the sort of portraits I wanted to take. And I, I couldn't somehow describe them very well. And then I said, like those two dancing on the dance floor, those, like those two women, I want to photograph those two women. They're the sort of women I want to photograph. And she put me on a dare. She said, go and ask them. Go and organise a picture of them. And I said, no, no, I couldn't do that. I couldn't. And she said, how are you going to photograph the people you want to photograph if you don't go and ask them? <laughs> so I went and asked them. And I asked them to come. I had a studio in um, Dunedin. And I invited them to come and be photographed by me the following night, dressed in exactly what they were wearing then, which is, which is then. I didn't want to photograph them in their home. At this stage, these three images so far, I haven't photographed the people in their own environments. 
because at that time I wasn't particularly interested. I was more interested in getting pictures of them in environments that I chose, that I felt seemed appropriate, the sort of image I wanted. These are two half-brothers, and those black marks up there aren't in the frame. They must be on the slide. Um, they um, came and asked me to photograph them for Mother's Day. <laughs> so I thought, oh, how am I going to photograph them? And I thought, right, OK, I'll just photograph them. Them. And that was the third shot. I thought it was really great. <laughs> They're Auckland guys. Any questions so far? What did Mother think? I don't know, never found out. Tom, no, Greg and Tom Bainbridge, brothers. This is a young girl, oh hell, that's on the slide too. That, that mark isn't in there. This looks very distracting. Um, this is a young girl, Deborah Clark, who's 23 and pregnant. It's just, look, there's no other, unless you like to stand there, Rhonda, and twiddle the, the lens, there's no other way of adjusting the focus, unless someone else would like to do it. Um, she asked me to photograph her, it's a commissioned portrait, and I photographed her in this building, just along a bit, in the room down the end of the corridor. This young man, 15 year old, he um, is a friend of mine, and he just had his hair cut. And I thought, I want to photograph a haircut. And I didn't intend, actually, to get a portrait. I actually just intended to get a picture of a haircut. And I came out with a portrait. It's taken outside, just in the skylight, in the shade. This is a picture I took of a friend of mine in Dunedin, in an old hotel called the Excelsior, where I photographed a lot of people over the years. It's in the bathroom. And I felt that this picture, out of all the ones I'd done, was the most successful. It captured vulnerability and strength, and it's not a sentimental image, although it could potentially be one. But it seemed to, I think, trans somehow transcend that. At the time I did this, or when I was working in the Excelsior Hotel, I was very interested in very simple, stark formalism, compositionally, and very strong light, light and dark. And it's a very tricky situation because you can actually come away with an image that's contrived. And in all my work, I fear contrivance. At the same time, I contrive my images. This is, anyway. This is an image of Wellington sculptor Vivian Lin, taken in the spare room, the guest room of her home. It's a turtle shell. Now, this is a, oops, go back. This is a self-portrait of Al Lizitsky, a Russian Bauhaus designer. He's an artist and he's photographed himself. From now on, I'm going to show you my portraits of artists, but I want to, I want to show you um, what sort of was behind my images. This particular portrait, I'm very interested in self-portraiture. Here's another one, Cindy Sherman. I think this is one of the, these series of her, this series of her work of the film stills, I personally feel, are her most successful. 
because we know she is not the woman that she is acting out. But when we look at the picture, when I look at the picture, I, um, I see a portrait of a, of, of, of a woman. I don't see a Cindy, a Cindy Sherman self-portrait. Whereas in her later work, the colour work, I am too caught up in the fact that she's just dressed up and taken herself. Even though they are really clever, clever constructions, I'm not moved. Whereas I think her film stills, where she acted out actresses like Shirley MacLaine and people like that are out of particular movies, I think they're definitely much stronger. This is one that I really love. I like the starkness, the black and white. Also, I like that odd angle enormously. And also the fact that she's included, I think this helps the strength of the image, strengthens the image. She's included a portrait of somebody else. So you recognise, or I am instantly taken to have the feeling that that is a portrait of somebody else, not a portrait of Cindy Sherman being somebody else. I find that really interesting material. This is a portrait Oh, well, there we are, Marion Moore, 1958. Um, I was very, very interested in Avedon's work and his white studio, no surroundings. Um, but in the end, I, I just felt they were very sterile and cold and that it tended to treat people. I photographed like him for a while, but, but I became very disillusioned and empty by it. Um, and I felt that his work um, is quite sterile, apart from one or two that I've seen. And this one in particular, this is with a tiny reproduction of the magazine. So that's what, the, it's a screen on the, on the reproduction that's not part of this picture. But this one I felt was, was, was wonderful um, because um, he'd introduced a prop and put on the wind machine and, <laughs> and transformed it. It didn't seem to be like a Richard Avedon portrait. It was, uh, it was Richard Avedon photographing what what he felt, Marian, how Marion Moore should, he, how he wanted to show Marion Moore. And I think that's a really lovely picture, and I wish he'd do that more often. This is an Arbus portrait of, of, um, of Kate Millett. Once again, an artist photographing an artist. All these are photographs so far are artists photographing other artists, be they dressing up as themselves or photographing themselves, like in the Elder Sitsky one or photographing other, oh, could, could you do that? Great. <laughs> um, here, when I was about to photograph my series of artists, I didn't want to, initially, I didn't really want to have any kind of reverence for them. At the same time, I didn't want to just concentrate on, on, let, let the floor dominate. Um, so I look back at a lot of other work, other people's work um, that I admired, and this particular one of Kate Millett and her boyfriend was a really interesting image because, um, interesting in two ways. The first thing that interested me was the fact that I read a lot of Kate Millett, and whenever she wrote, wrote about herself in the early days when her and Fumio were living together, I always had the sense that he was a very powerful figure. It exuded, a, 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 obviously he exudes a power, but for some reason in her writing, he seemed to exude a strong physical presence, and I tended to see him as large, big. And then when I got this book of Diane Arbus's magazine work, which was all her other pictures that weren't of freaks, though many of personalities, um, I was really shocked. <laughs> so he's tiny. She's bigger than him. And <laughs> I, was, I was intrigued, enormously intrigued. And I thought, he's sitting back and she's sitting forward. I, I, try, I battled with it. You know, I, I battled with it. No, no, she's... It was very interesting. I measured the heads and, you know... <laughs> <laughs> I had to work it out. And then I thought, no, she is actually... And, and the fact that Arbus didn't um, didn't make him into kind of a reverential figure by putting him forward, perhaps Kate Middleton back, or even on an equal plane. 
and the way he's sitting there quite timid and round shouldered and Kate Millett is very direct in her gaze and her body is also relatively open whereas I find he's actually quite close, his upper half is, is open but he's, he's quite tight and the other thing that, that, that I liked was the fact that it was, it was sort of a point blank image and I liked her, I love the our buses work better in magazine work than her freak pictures formally I find that, um, that her, uh, her formalism really comes out very strongly in her magazine work and I find them visually very, very pleasing. Content doesn't overrule. Uh, I find her freak pictures are more overawed by her subject matter and content. Uh, but I love her bravery and her courage and I find her, the person, enormously inspiring. This is the picture by Sheila Metzner, who I also love her portrait work enormously. Uh, it's a picture of um, Susan Rothenberg, the New York painter. This is in a magazine. And um, I, um, I just love the way, you know, it was her back, it wasn't her face. And it was of the working situation and her looking at one of her paintings. And I thought, that's beautiful, and I love the colour. I absolutely adored the colour. We won't talk about why I don't use colour, all right? Um, but I, I, I love colour photography, good colour photography. And it was just such a beautiful image, a very powerful one. And the fact that I couldn't actually see Susan, um, Susan Rothenberg's face didn't matter. I had the sense of her as a person and as an artist. I also liked the... Um, how she included the full painting. She didn't clip it. This is some of my work now of artists that I photographed in Auckland and Wellington and Christchurch over the last few months or last year. Um, this is of Sharo Oquette, the last day she was in her studio before departing for America a week later. It's the very last day, the last hour when we took the, finished taking the pictures, we took the clean sack out and shut the door and that was it. And she never went back. And so it was quite, quite important. I wanted to photograph her in a studio. And her paintings, the studio had been stripped, paintings had come down. And that's just how it was when I arrived. I'd been to see her studio about a week before because I was looking for places to photograph her. And I didn't, the paintings were up when I went, and then when I went back, they were all down. I thought, oh no, and then I thought, but I, that, that's just right, that's, that's, that's just right, I think that's fine. I didn't actually know Charo very well. In these images, the next set of images, I don't, haven't actually known the people all that well, apart from one or two, and I'm not photographing and making pictures in order for you to like the people in them. I'm not interested in people making friends with the people in the photos. I'm more interested in documenting my ideas, uh, visual ideas, exploring my visual ideas and um, in terms of how I feel or what I think about each person. Now the visual idea could come from a particular thing they say, it could come from where they live, a particular corner, a particular light, um, or else it, it could come from uh, not me not, not even wanting to know them at all, just wanting to photograph them. Because visually I want to record them. I want to record a visual aspect. I hardly knew Charo. This one's Marty Zerme uh, at the back of her mother's house in Mount Roskill. I've been a great admirer of Marty Zerme's work. Oopsie, I'll go back. I was just trying to focus that again. It's, it keeps popping. Um, I had um, been quite an admirer of Marta Zerme's sculpture about 10, 12 years ago when I saw a show of hers in Dunedin. And she actually, her work, although I'm not particularly inspired by it now, but her work then gave me a feeling of form and that I just felt I wanted to indulge in exploring form. I wasn't particularly interested in content. so. But that was early on. This particular image, um, when I went to photograph her 
I couldn't figure out how to do it because here she lived in Mount Roscoe in the suburbs and in the suburbs. This is not my my image of Marta Zuma. I don't imagine it would be like this. I sort of imagined her in another environment. But then, then I had to come to terms with the fact, well, this is Marta Zuma. This is where she lives. And this is how I want to photograph her. So I said, can you dress up in black? So she did. Also has relationships to surfaces, I think. This is Geoffrey Harris. I photographed at Sue Crockford Gallery a few months ago. Um, I'd, I've photographed Geoffrey several times over the years in different ways, but always with a very sort of seedy, weedy <laughs> kind of... <laughs> <laughs> because that's what he was. He had no money. He was just getting recognised, but um, worked very hard. Um, I didn't like all his paintings, but I admired his energy, and some of his work I did like, but really I thought a lot of his work was very violent, and I couldn't quite come to terms with the violence in his imagery. But I love the colours in his work, and I love the energy in his work. And um, anyway, I wanted to photograph him, and he came up from Dunedin to open an exhibition of his last year. And I met him in the street, and we talked, and then I went to his gallery opening at... Um, Sue Crockford, and I thought, how oh, he's changed, he's changed. Anyway, in the meantime, he's, he has changed. And I had to come to terms with the fact that he's changed. He looks like that, an urban cowboy. And, and um, I decided, but I'd like to actually photograph that, his height. He's tall, and he has got his own style. And um, in the Sue Crockford Gallery, it was the perfect space. And, um, you know, his blackness and his height, and, and also... He's not looking anxious, like most pictures of him do. This is Vivian Lin, again, I photographed before. Um, this is more her, whereas the other one was more an appropriation to a mythological image. This one is, I think, Vivian Lin at home, in, in her guest room. A, a very difficult image to do. The lighting was very unkind, but I managed to get a print. I like framing people within frames. Seems to come out a lot in my work. This is Janet Paul in her studio in Wellington. Any questions so far? Comments? Right. It's Jackie Fraser in her child's bedroom. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the sort of things I do within making image. Are you interested in hearing that? Mm -hmm. Is that? Okay. Um, I told Jackie to wear something light. I'd visited her about a week before and I loved the wardrobe door. I just thought that was the best place for her. And I asked her to wear something light because she's against the dark and I wanted to create a shape. And I had a feeling when I was thinking of this picture before I did it that I had a feeling of a bride walking down an aisle. Now, I don't know where I get that from, but she seemed to bring this out. And I was in the bath one night, and I, this image, couldn't I couldn't shake it away. And this sort of feeling of smallness and power. And um, so that's where I photographed it. And I included the, the dog, the, the little rocking horse dog. That was over in another space, but I needed something to anchor that corner of the image. Also, I wanted a little bit more whimsy in the image. There was a few more things sitting up on the wardrobe, but I felt they didn't help at all, so I removed them and just left the drum as it just exactly where it was. I centered it a little bit because it was slightly off because I wanted to make full use of the join in the door. 
make it a positive force in the image. Not, I mean, having something like that above a head is a very dangerous thing to do because it can completely split the person up or distract enormously. But I felt that actually strengthened her because it continued on. This is Andrew Drummond in his home in Dunedin. He's a sculptor. Brahman Cornish. at home. And that one, I, I, I do some rather naughty things. Um, I don't always go for what's there and accept the given. I like to remove it if I don't like it. And that one, I stripped the walls, moved the furniture, stripped everything out entirely for that one. We worked for about half an hour or 20 minutes. And um, I like that idea better. It seemed to reflect her or how I felt about her. I liked it. Just liked it. If it didn't work, I, I, I would have put all the things back and reshot. But it worked. Tos, Sir Tosville Wollaston, reclining in a hotel room. <laughs> he was just up here for a couple of days. I wanted to sort of try out. I had a choice of photographing him in a studio up here or photographing him in a hotel room. And I had to make a decision very quickly because I was only here for about a day or two. And I instantly went for the hotel room because it was a different environment and I wanted more intimacy. And I actually am trying to strive for that more in my work. But this is the very sort of first sign of it. And I also wanted an old man looking like that. I had a sort of an idea I'd like to do that. And he seemed to be the sort of person to do it with. And also he was tired. And it seemed unnatural to prop him up and look strong, to put on a front. Because I, I liked him, I liked him more the way he was. It's Louise Henderson in her bedroom. She's a painter, French, a very powerful, energetic woman. Still bleaches her hair and paints her long fingernails scarlet red and her lipstick's the same and she wears Pierre Cardin sweatshirts. <laughs> and she lives in a reasonably austere environment but very textural and, and uh, I like the austerity is, a, is quite beautiful. Gordon Walters, he's a New Zealand abstract painter, photographed him in Christchurch. That was in his studio, the basement of his house. I met him for half an hour the day before, had a quick chat, scanned around left because he was very busy. I was very aware of him being busy because he told me he was busy, didn't have much time. And then went back the next day having had a reasonably fixed idea of how I wanted to do him in terms of the environment. And I took a whole roll, set the camera up, took a whole roll within about five minutes, as long as it takes to expose 12 exposures on a, on a, on a, on a, on a camera. And he, he, I asked him to move around and um, tighten up, tense up physically. So he did that. It was perfect. Joanna Paul, this is a very early one, but I feel it's appropriate for this part of the series. Taken in Dunedin in 1981, in her living room. You may have seen this image before, it has been exhibited in Auckland. She just washed her hair, and she said, oh, you should wait for my hair to dry. I said, no. I want to photograph it. Wet. I like all the textures too. 
shapes. Milan Mercosic in his studio. Sorry about this projector. An echo of his work. I don't always go for that because sometimes I'm not interested in it. There's the danger of being like Arnold Newman, and I don't like his work. I find it very arty farty and contrived and just laughable. I look at his work, I used to like it years ago, especially the one of Stravinsky by the piano, I thought was really wonderful. But um, it didn't last. I looked at it just recently, actually, when I was looking for work for this idea. And I just, I thought, you've got to be joking. You know, it didn't come through. One or two did, but not nearly the way that, um, I don't, you see this, once again, as well as talking to you before, I can try, I can try my images in terms of controlling where they sit, where people sit and everything like that. But I don't, the fear is letting that contrivance out, but at the same time being totally dependent on it. It's a very tricky, interesting situation. So is that his pose or your pose? The arms across the arms? Um, he sat up like this. <laughs> he was frightened. And um, he was like that for a while. And I thought, like, this, that's not going to be a good picture at all. It's not going to be a good picture. It might be how he is, but I, I don't want, I don't, it's not going to be right. So I said, can you put your arms down? Meaning that perhaps he would drop them, fold them like that, rather than up like that. And then he did that. So I got it, second shot, and then he changed. It's a very quick moment. It's Dennis O'Connor, sculptor, ceramicist at Waiheke Island, the back of his um, house. I have long sort of meetings with these people a week or a few days or months before photographing them. This is Ains Westra in her bedroom. Is it, am I leaving these on long enough? Or? Right. I've seen them many times. <laughs> Janet Bailey in Wellington Graveyard. She's a photographer, you've probably heard of her. Know her work. This is the last of the artist series so far. The next set, I was commissioned to photograph for Buddle Findlay, a portrait of law with four photographers, myself and three others, Janet was one of them actually, um, had to come up with a series of pictures that depicted a portrait of law, um, eight images, within about two months. And I felt that was really high pressure to come up with something in two months was, was the only thing I didn't like about the whole project was only having two months to do it everything else I liked so I thought well what what am I going to do because in one sense I sort of somehow the anarchist in me says law is an unnecessary evil and you know I wanted to come down completely on it At the other end of the scale I thought what well, we actually need it and it does serve a purpose and people are ignorant of it and I went through a lot of things and I thought well I've only got basically a month to do it because I had other commitments so I decided on Auckland lawyers but first of all I looked at about three or four selected three or four images that were kind of behind inspiring my thoughts on what I should do and the direction in which I should go in for the project 
This is um, an image by Jenny Holzer, an American woman. And, um, and I love her work of using available neon signs and billboards and, and puts up her own statements that say a lot about the situation in which the sign hangs and you know, has, has a rather interesting sense of humour attached to it as well. And I thought a lot about law and power. Sorry? Who was that last in the Jenny Holzer. Holzer. H O L Z E R. This is an image gambler type on the French Riviera by Lisette Modell. And I thought, well, the law, you know, is about victims, it's about people who victimise others. This is another angle that we could have taken. Um, and here we have someone who rips, who looks like he would, could rip off others essentially though is, is kind of trapped himself within the game. And I sort of thought about legal people being in that kind of area. They're sort of trapped and victims as much as the people they're trying to help. Some of them, some of them are very rich too. This is a picture by Mary, Mary Ellen Mark, who I greatly admire. Singles Bar, New York, 1977. <laughs> Once again, this, this feeling of victims. I had, I had certain thoughts about this image for this talk. Um, you mean people trapped by their circumstances? Yeah, yeah, right. Um, but also using the circumstances for their own gain. I mean, that image, he's looking at her, but he's only got one thing in mind, which is perfectly illustrated and the shot of the woman behind, and also the happy couples up above. And it's just, um, I don't always have a lot of words to say about these images, by the way, but they do trigger off responses. This is an image by Abigail Heyman called Growing Up Female. It was a photo essay she had done, which was produced in a book which I bought in the early 70s of her work, which I, th I think is very, very powerful. And here we have a woman seemingly stuck at home, trapped at home and trapped, not being able to get out of her circumstances, not being able to have any control. And I kind of saw people and the law like that. Does the law really help us in the end? Or you know, how does it help us? At the same time, this is the kind of view I had, because I don't know many lawyers, I haven't had much experience of the law, and I thought, well, I would decide to photograph something accessible um, and somehow try and personalise law. I don't, I still don't know if I've done it or not, but I attempted to do it by photographing Auckland lawyers, which will be the next series. This is Keith Langdon. Um, sole practitioner in his Ponsonby storefront office, Jervois Road. <clears throat> I wanted to somehow photograph the people not like... It was very difficult photographing these people because I hadn't met any of them before. And initially when they met me, they sort of put their elbows up on the desk and put on a nice, respectable front. Meanwhile, I saw he had shorts on and I, and I could see all these things. The doodle pad, he was all set to rip that out of his blotter pad, the doodles. And I said, don't, just leave that for tomorrow because I'll do the photograph the next day. And I tended to have to sort of do these things. One other incident which I'll tell you about is I went to photograph another person which... Um, he had his shirt tails hanging out, his, his tie and a tiny knot but all twisted and, and sort of everywhere. He had a pencil in his ear, his desk was totally chaotic, um, ashtrays full, it was, it was a wonderful image of chaos and, and he was a very straight looking sort of young man. And I arrived and he just had his shirt sleeves up, shirt tails hanging out. 
and I thought, right, I'd like to photograph you. And um, next day I turned up, he had his tie done up here, his suit on, completely tidied up the office. And it, the character disappeared. I didn't take him. Well, I did, but I didn't like it, never used it. So there's this <coughs> sort of thing that happens, people tend to think they have to change for the camera. But essentially when I meet them, when I met these people, I wanted what was actually being presented to me, which is how they were presenting themselves. And in a way, I kind of saw it from the client's point of view. That's what the client would actually see. They don't see the front. This is um, an image that probably relates more to my formal, my earlier work, but I, I like it. Uh, this is Clive Edwards, Crane Happy Road lawyer who owns his own law firm. And that's taken in his waiting room. I chose the waiting room because towards the end of the series I was starting to dry up and I got bored with offices. And I liked his waiting room and it was, and it was full of people. And I did a, quite a few shots of him with people next to him and one person there and one person there and sort of moving around doing a few things. And the people were very good, very patient. It's all done in about 10 minutes. And um, I liked that idea the best because in the other ones, the people tended to dominate. It looked like Clive Edwards and, or something, you know, the, the person that wasn't enough of him. Also, I liked the tarpa cloth, but there was a great danger that it would dominate and that it would be him with the tarpa cloth. But by having this beautiful patterned shirt, offset it beautifully, and you come right back to the central focus. And I really like using side uh, counters. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, countering and um, adding more interest to, this, to the central element. And I learned a lot about that, or discovered I'd actually been doing that in my work, but began to consciously manipulate. This is Wendell Archibald. <laughs> That's his name. Um, who is a solicitor at the Grey Lynn Community Centre. It was taken late on a Friday afternoon. I've been with him for about an hour. Took one roll, and then we went out into the kitchen at the back of the office area and had a cup of coffee and talked and ate biscuits and chatted about lots of things and they offered me a beer and and then he seemed to relax, he calmed right down and I said, can I come and take your picture, some more pictures of you, just, just go into the office, take your cup of coffee in there and I'll photograph you there. And I put mine up on a cabinet where I had my camera. And he put his coffee down, and I had the camera all ready, he put his coffee down and then there was this great sunspot behind him on the wall and it, I just asked him to lean forward fractionally just to hide it because it seemed, seemed too distracting. And he just leaned forward, but he was listening to what I was saying at the same time, and then I just got that very quickly. He calls his office the cell. He's a lawyer. Doesn't pay any rent. This is John Geddes, um, local solicitor in his Princess Street interview room. Um, he was a very wooden character and very theatrical and loves the courtroom because he likes performing. I had this little feeling I got from him and I felt his interview room was quite theatrical. And um, I decided to incorporate those elements. That's his file cabinet, cupboard, and he's holding keys. This is Bromman Davis, corporate lawyer, corporate solicitor, 20th, in a 20th floor office in a downtown tower. She's just starting out. Ambitious, originally wanted to be a policewoman. I was really taken by the fact that the office was just so empty. On the 20th floor you expect something, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> the foyer and, and the firm she worked for, they occupy eight floors of the BNZ Tower in Queen Street. It's just one of the floors they occupy, the top eight. 
and the foyers were very grand. I actually took a lot of shots of her in the foyers, but I felt they were all about the firm she worked for, not enough about her, and I felt she was more interesting. And I thought that was a, and that, that one, I took a few images like that, and her head was continually hitting, visually hitting, the, um, the, the folders. And so I just asked her just to move her head this way because I wanted a clean background and a more, much stronger focus on her. And so she did and that was it. This is um, a young man called Michael Littlewood who is um, a lawyer with the Graylin Law Centre. <coughs> Can you fight with me? <laughs> this is staff solicitor in the foyer of his firm's law library. I was also deeply indebted to a German photographer living in England. I'd seen some of her work through a series of very crude slides that were sent to me from a photographer in Christchurch when I was talking about the law project. And the, the, the German photographer who lives in, in England but takes a lot of pictures in, in Paris is called Karen Noor. And I was very sort of motivated, I became, when I looked at her work, strongly motivated to make personal statements about who I saw. But her work, as she calls it, is non-portrait work, where she doesn't disclose the name of the person in the image. She's more interested in the representative in the image and the values in which they represent. Whereas in my work, I, I actually do like to disclose the identity of the person in the image, because I'm not just talking about values other than them. I'm talking about them with them, within them. And this is the last one, I think. Denise Hanare. She's a law firm partner in a Queen Street office. She's Maori. I think that's it. Any questions? How did you choose the lawyers? Um, after a few weeks of struggle, I um, was in despair and I rang up the Auckland Law Society and was given the name of the secretary, I think, of the D Auckland Law Society, and he was an ex-journalist. And I had a long talk with him and told him the sort of characters I wanted, explained my project, that I didn't want traditional lawyer characters, I wanted offbeat ones. And I gave him a list of the sort of people I wanted. I made, I was quite clear about what I wanted. And, um, 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 oh, no, I think that's it actually, I'll just check, yep. And um, he gave me a list of 13 or 14 names and I went and met them all and photographed 12 people, did one again, um, out of which I chose eight, which was the minimum requirement. Also, I, man I got eight I really liked. I thought it'd be nice to get nine. But one wasn't quite strong enough, wasn't quite right. It looked too not quite right, so I included eight. Hmm. But it was the Auckland District Law Society. I know one of the lawyers there, and I agree entirely with your photograph. Who? John McHale, yes. Ah, oh, that's good. Because <laughs> I didn't spend long with them, and I met them in their, um, their practices, you know. So I, I drew lots of assumptions and personal judgments. I was very judgmental. I allowed myself to be judgmental. I don't, I learned a lot from this project. I don't recoil from making judgments. Because there's, yeah.
I didn't want to, I don't like to make, I, I don't think everything is equal. <laughs> Sorry? Are you interested in their, their response to your Oh, if they care to ring me up and ask to have a look at the image, I'd love them to see it. And, but I decided I wouldn't go around and chase them up because none of them took down my name or my telephone number. None of them made contact with me after. And initially, I was going to run around and give them, distribute their picture. But I decided I was, t I was absolutely exhausted after the project. It took a whole month of really hard work. I had to needle, I had to cajole, charm, do everything to get what I wanted. And they were doing this a lot of the time because they are busy people. And one person said, I'm very busy. I said, I'm very busy too. There's this power thing happening. And um, I sort of got angry at some points. And um, I thought, well, look, if they want their picture, if they want to see what, what they've done, they can contact me. They haven't done it yet. Uh, how many, um, not just the lawyers, but when you're doing a portrait, how many rolls of film would you normally use on average? I suppose it would be... One to two. One Twelve two. exposures. Yes. On average, one. But for the law project, I went through a lot of film because they only had so much time. And I, it was good because I became a lot more experimental. So two films from now on. And you would hope to get one good image? Yes. I only, I only strive for one. Sometimes it doesn't work, and I feel the person um, is, um, you know, a really interesting person. And I dismissed. I know I can get it. I'll go back, like Denise Hanare. That was a shoot a week later because I felt I really wanted her in it. Yeah. Um, a photograph is um, a, a picture of something that doesn't seem to express any kind of presence. It seems detached. The person, I'm talking about photographs of people, or, or in regards to that question. Um, It's, when I look at, I can only, at the moment, to answer your question, I'm just looking at my proof sheets in my mind and, and looking at the ones I reject and the ones I circle. Um, the ones that, that I reject are the ones that don't come through, um, don't have any kind of presence. The ones that come through have too much presence and I'm terrified and I'll, I'll reject it and then three weeks later or two months later I'll go back and rescue it. Some of them are from that experience. And some of them shine right out. It's to do with presence, the person in the photograph. Whether I feel I really have, whether they're there, whether they, they come through, whether they're present within the proof sheet. Is that? Mm. that no. Presence, I think that's the best word. But there's other words. But. Mm. Sorry? So when you do it, you did a series about law, but all your pictures are about lawyers or mm. about lawyers. Mm. Yeah, I, I said that, and when I introduced that, was that I wanted to personalise it. And I wanted to, um, what I meant by that was I wanted to show the people, people publicly, just what lawyers look like in their offices from a client's point of view. Oh, God. Oh, don't talk about that. <laughs> it's not colour photography, that was puddling around. Sorry, what was your question? <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I wouldn't, I haven't even got that on my curriculum vitae. <laughs> I was um, asked to do a show, and I came up with something, and I was in between, and uh, I didn't know what to do, and I thought I wanted to do something different. So I did Xeroxes of studio pictures I'd already done and just sort of um, tarted them up. And now I look back at that work, I think, oh, there's only one good one out of it. And that's, that's just because of, out of a personal thing, 
not because it has any great meaning outside of it. It's the son of a friend of mine, and you know that the mother has the picture in her in her house. But um, I actually thought that they were actually quite crude and ugly. Now I look back at them, but it was interesting to do. But I wouldn't know. That's my assessment of my work. Other people like them, but but cold. <coughs> right, that's it.